Oh, by the way, the, the barbecue fork comment did make it on the live stream. The joke I made about Carol chasing you with the barbecue fork. <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> so now I think it's made it on two different recordings. <laughs> yes, Josiah came prepared today. All right. Nice shirt. Been missing that for the last three weeks. I know. Oh, wow. I keep trying. He wore it all day at school today, too. I don't know that I had the guts to wear a taco cat to school when I was your age, but more power I don't like the guy on the side. is very self-assured. I don't really care who, <laughs> what people think about me. That's probably the main thing. Mm -hmm. So I'll wear my cat stuff. So. Well, I'm glad you like it. The guy on the overload too would say, I kind of get beat up for wearing something like that. Yeah, the sweater. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's see. Announcements. Um, today is the 21st. It is almost Christmas. Um, the ladies' Christmas party was last night. I heard it went wonderful. I even got some leftover chili. I had that for lunch tonight. It was very nice. Um, so thank you for everybody who worked to get that together, especially, it, well, pretty much it was Diane and Bethany who yeah. did most of the work there. Yeah. So I just want to give a thank you to them. I think there were 13 or 14 ladies there. 13. I was number 13. You were, you were lucky 13. All right. <laughs> Uh, Darlene is online with us and Venus is online with us. Hello, thank you for joining us. Venus, I will try to do better watching the comments tonight. <laughs> um, so just to get all of our Christmas services straight, on Saturday we will be having a Christmas Eve service at 7 p.m. We will be doing a candle lighting and we will be having communion together. I keep saying that because we didn't have communion earlier this month because we're planning on having it here. And I guess we could have just done both. But um, I want everybody to know that, that they can come here and take communion on Christmas Eve if you want. That is at 7 p.m. And then on Christmas Day, which is a Sunday this year, we are having church. We are not having Sunday school and we are not having our evening service. So we are having morning worship at 11 a.m. on Christmas. Um, but not Sunday school and not evening. Also, the week between Christmas and New Year's, we are not having our midweek services. So Monday the 26th, there will be no men's group. Tuesday the 27th, there will be no ladies' ministries. Wednesday the 28th, there will be no prayer meeting and Bible study. On Thursday the 29th, there will be AA. The AA group has decided, especially because of the need that arises around the holidays, they are still holding their meeting. So for anybody who's listening about that, AA will still be meeting on Thursday. It's just the church stuff that we're not having. Um, on the next Sunday, it's gonna be New Year's Day. We are going to have our Sunday night service that night. We're gonna be back to our regular schedule that Sunday, um, just so that we don't miss two weeks in a row. I didn't really wanna miss two weeks in a row. Um, plus, I'm gonna be so hungry on Christmas Day, because. Yeah, the we still have the hot sauce. Um, so that's kind of our schedule for the time coming up. Um, if you're keeping track, Friday is Worky Layman's birthday. So if you can, say happy birthday to her. And today is Ivelisse and Cisco's anniversary. So for all of our friends online, jump over to Eva Lisa's Facebook and wish her a happy anniversary because that is today. Um, what else do I, I guess the Advent devotionals, we still have them and there are still a couple left. So, I mean, it's, it's good to do. So if you haven't done it and you're interested, there's still a few left. Um, any that we don't use, we're gonna give away soon. So just kind of keep an eye on that. Generally, people ask us sometimes, generally if we have extras, We'll try to keep one in the library so people can go and look at it to borrow. But then any that are extra, we either give out at the food pantry or we give to Pastor Tom to give away at the mission. So we don't hold on to, we want devotions to be in people's hands. So they don't do anybody any good gathering dust. Oh, Diane Utley is on with us as well. Hello, Diane. I was just saying thank you for all the work you and Bethany put in. Tell her to I said thank you too. Oh, Carol says thank you too. Um, we should hire Diane to cater the men's Christmas party next year. What do you think? No? Yes? Maybe. 
don't think that far ahead anymore. Yeah, I don't think that far ahead either. I think that's all of our announcements, right? If you have not brought in Christmas cards yet, you can still bring them in on Christmas Eve. Our goal is to have all the cards sorted, ready to pick up on Christmas Day. There are a lot sorted already. So for you guys here tonight or anybody coming in, what? All the ones we have are sorted. Right, so I'm just saying, we do have a lot in the box, but we are gonna keep the red mailbox out through Christmas Eve. So anybody who's running a little late this year, getting the cards together, it's not too late to bring cards in if you want to bring them in to give to people. All right, I think that covers all of our announcements, right? Did I miss anything, Joe? I don't think so. No. Um, do we have any pantry announcements? Um, I think one of the things we're, that would be good to bring in right now are spaghetti sauce, right? That was, um, we're good on, so we're pretty good on soup. Um, we're pretty good on cereal. We can definitely use some oatmeal. And um, the one thing we are really low on still are the kind of th the the canned ravioli or canned spaghettios, that kind of thing. That's yeah, like the chef boyardee or spaghetti or stuff that the kids that the kids love. Yeah. So that would be something really good to bring in. Um, we're decent on pasta. We don't have a ton of ramen, and that's a real popular item too. And it's one that's not very expensive. So, yeah, I mentioned Chef Um If you are interested in buying proteins to donate, maybe talk with us and we'll try to work that out. Um, you can either donate money towards that, or if you want to buy some of that, we can work it out. We just need to make sure somebody's here to get it into the freezer. If you wanted to buy packs of hot dogs, or packs of meat. Um, we tend to be able to get whole chickens from the mission, but if you wanted to donate like packs of chicken, um, that would be good. Something we almost never have is ground beef. So if somebody wanted to buy a bunch of the packs, the one pound packs of ground beef, that could be a good thing. I'm just thinking outside the box here. Darlene said yes, oatmeal and kids stuff. Okay. Okay, um, I think that's it for, oh, Darlene said fish, that's true, that's another good one if you want to donate protein. Mm -hmm. um, we do have people who are pescatarian, I guess we'd say, right? Um, so fish is a good thing. We have lots of canned tuna, but, but yeah, fish. Um, like the frozen fish fillets are a real good one, or even fish sticks are good too. Yeah, those salmon's went good. Yeah, the salmon went real fast this month. Hi. Hello, how are you? Good. Sorry good to late. Show. You're good. We were just doing some announcements. We generally run a few minutes late around here, so that's kind of how we roll. All right, so I think that's all of our announcements. So let's get into our prayer time. Do we want to do our local requests first or our international requests? Okay, international it is. So we do have an update from Matt and Tammy Woodley. I forwarded the email out to our list. Um, we've been praying for their daughter, Ilana. She had osteomyelitis in her hip, so an infection in the bone. Um, she has been responding well to the antibiotics. They said that she still has a limp and is working. Let me just read it because they said it better than I could. All right, this is from their update. Thank you all for your prayers for Alana these past few weeks. We have seen God's provision from a connection with an orthopedist who provided a clear diagnosis, to passports arriving in the nick of time, to housing in a car, to a fabulous children's hospital, to the generosity of people who have offered additional financial support. We are happy to report that Alana's appointment went well yesterday. Her CRP number was improved. Do you know what that one is? C-reactive protein. C-reactive protein, so that inflammation. signal inflammation. Okay, I don't know these things. Um, so she is still, she's able to bear weight a little bit more, but she is still limping. And they will be heading, they were planning on heading back to Kujip, um yesterday. So I don't know if they arrived or not, but they're at the point where they can just talk to the Australian orthopedist over the computer and they can do her blood work in Papua New Guinea. So they are headed home. Um, 
if you didn't get a chance, if you if you don't get their newsletter, you should check it up, check it up, check it out. Um, past, there was a really great testimony, and I'm not going to do it justice, but um, Dr. Matt got a was contacted because there were two brothers who had been in a fight. One of them was only 12 years old, and he got hit in the back of the ankle with a machete, and it, it cut his Achilles tendon. And Matt ran and hiked to meet them. Yeah, and he ended up kind of sitting on a log by a waterfall, sewing this guy, this kid's tendon back together. Hmm. And he, in his story, he talked about how there are a lot of injuries like that where people need some advanced medical care and aren't able to get it and end up disabled because of it. People who can't use their hands or who can't walk. Um, I mean, he, in the story he talked about how his father had an accident and cut his hand while working on a lawnmower just recently and cut the tendon to his pinky finger. And his dad was able to go to the ER, see a specialist, have surgery, everything within a couple of days and was back to normal with just a little scar and how different it is where they are in Papua New Guinea. Um, so it, it says how important Kujup Station is, but he's not an orthopedic surgeon, <laughs> um, but he said he had a conversation with the parents just saying, you know, if, if you're not going to be able to get to the big hospital, it might be better to do something rather than nothing. And he said he was like, he was in a t-shirt and shorts because he had ran there. <laughs> And he was soaking wet, and he did surgery, and luckily the boy responded well. But it's just a reminder that there are a lot of people in the world who don't have access to the kinds of medicine we have here. So. No, under those conditions, the yeah. infection could set in fast. Yeah, well, even talking to um, Doug and Emma today, you know, that there are even over-the-counter medicines that we can go to the drugstore and get yeah. that. They, can't, they don't have access to in Mauritius. Yeah. So it's a big praise for Ilana, but also please keep praying that she'll be able to um, keep, regain, keep being able to bear weight on that hip and that she won't end up with any complications. Um, the country that we are praying for tonight from our NMI Central newsletter is Peru. We actually mentioned Peru last week and prayed for them a little bit. They are dealing with some very significant government upheaval right now. Um, I, I don't understand all the details, but the, their Congress was going to impeach the president, and so then the president tried to disband Congress, and then the president ended up getting arrested. And so I don't, I don't pretend to know who's right or wrong in a situation like this, but just know that it's, it, it's a very dangerous situation. Um, there's a very high potential for violence right now. So please pray for that. I know that there's a lot of Americans who couldn't get out. Yeah. They kind of locked everything down when this all started yeah. happening. And there were large areas where people were told that they were under house arrest, not to, not to even leave their house. So, um, But we do have some praises about the church there, so I am going to share that. Just for everybody's records, uh, the Church of the Nazarene began its work in Peru in 1914. Um, Peru is a country in South America that's home to part of the Amazon rainforest and the Machu Picchu um, archaeological site. It has a population of approximately 33.4 million people and the official language is Spanish. The church was started on the north coast in Pacasmayo and Chichlayo. Chichlayo? Chichlayo. Chichlayo. I can't see the word. C H I C L A Y O. Cheek. Chichlayo. Chichlayo? Mm -hmm. Chichlayo. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what it means. It's the name of a city. No, it's a, it's a weird word. Yeah. So, anyway. Um, through there, it spreads through the jungle and then through cities and towns and rural areas. Uh, the church has grown tremendously there with nearly a thousand local churches. 
Um, Peru lacks many major cities to plant churches. However, the leadership continues to trust God as they encourage to offer resources and continue to plant churches in Peru. And for those of you who might have our prayer cards that we gave out, um, this is where Harrison and Jennifer and their daughter Lisbeth serve. They serve in Peru right now. They are the work and witness coordinators. So you've met some people who are serving as missionaries in Peru. Um, I'm seeing some of these coming through on the chat. I'll get to them in just a second, everybody online. Um, so they have some prayer requests they'd like to share. They ask for prayer for their district assemblies coming up and for the leaders presiding over those meetings. They pray that as the year comes to a close, God will continue to be with the churches that are still navigating the transition from pandemic to face-to-face -face services. They ask for prayer that God would provide health and protection for the pastors and leaders in the face of the continuation of the pandemic and its variants. And they also ask for prayer for the National Women's Ministry Congress, which will take place in February 2023, as well as the Youth Leaders Congress in the city of Bagua Grande in June 2023, where 700 young people are expected to attend. Some of their praises are they praise God for the participation of 600 pastors in the national retreat in the city of Pucallpa, um, that they are feeling encouraged and ministerially challenged. I guess that's a good middle ground to be in, right? Encouraged and challenged. Thank God for the growth of the church at the national level, despite the pandemic and social crises in the country. And they thank God for the pastors who have been the heroes of the church by continuing to carry the gospel message faithfully and passionately. And then they have a, um, a longer testimony of that pastor's retreat that they gave a praise for. So, um, can you write for me? Because I'm not going to be able to keep up. Okay. Um, let's see. We'll go back to the top. Well, we've got a few to share here. Uh, uh, Venus had a praise. She said, thank you for last night. She said, it's the first time I've ever done anything like that. And I was a little nervous, but I had a great time. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. Um, Worky is still sick. Um, so the Laymans have canceled the vacation they were planning. Um, they were going to be going out to see Janice's family out in the Midwest. So please pray for the Laymans at their canceled vacation. I know it's sad not to see the family. They try to get out there every year to see Janice's family. And also pray for Worky. Her birthday um, is in a couple days, and we're praying that she can get a little bit better for her birthday and for Christmas. Darlene had a praise to share. Uh, I hope it's about the thing that we talked about for today. Um, sorry to be cryptic, but um, Diane has asked us to continue praying for David. Um, he is sick but still improving. I got to talk to him a little bit today. Uh, Venus said that Aunt Gloria is awake, but she is still on the ventilator. She had been doing better. And they were hoping to get her off the ventilator very soon. Um, they're still trying to figure out if she has any heart damage from the, the heart attack. Um, so we're continuing to pray. She has three different infections that she's dealing with now. She has COVID and flu and a bacterial infection. So it's a whole lot for her body to be going through right now. So please keep praying for Gloria and Steve. Diane said her cousin Anne is doing well, and she's asking for prayers for continued recovery. Anne had um, a kidney removed that had a tumor on it. Oh, Diane posted it on Facebook, so I can say it out loud. She said Beata offered her a job, and she accepted it. So amen for that. Congrats. Congrats. Yeah, congratulations, congratulations Darlene. Um, the, the nursing group that she was working for had been bought out and was closing. And this is another, this is a little bit bigger of an organization. Yeah. Um, but if it all works out, hopefully she can, she will still be doing home health care here in the same area. She might even have some of the same patients. Um, she said, thank you very much. Well, Darlene, it's wonderful to celebrate with you. I know that was a scary thing, finding out you were losing your job at the holidays. And 
We are so thankful that God provided. Yeah. That's awesome. Amen. Um, okay, I can take over now and look at some of the older ones if that's okay. Um, are there any from this room that we'd like to share for tonight? We got lots of online ones. How about you guys? I need to give praise. I went and saw my endocrinologist on Monday. Mm -hmm. And my last two A1Cs were so good that now she only needs to see me once every six months instead of every three months. So twice a year now instead of four times a year. Amen. It's all of those boxes you've been unpacking, keeping your blood sugar down, right? Yeah. <laughs> been something. Well, you've been busy the last couple of months, but amen. That is wonderful news. Glad you're doing well, brother. Your heart's good. Your blood sugar's good. Everything's tuned up. Wonderful. Uh, who else? Some of you might have heard when Pastor Doug was sharing that he has some chronic back problems yeah. and they flared up pretty bad. Hopefully he will be well enough for us to take him to the diner tomorrow. <laughs> oh, Eric is on with us too. Hello, Eric. Good to see you, brother. Um, all right, a couple that were mentioned earlier. We got an email. Um, Pastor Wes Tank, who runs Front Step Ministries in Philly, um, he fell today and broke his ankle. So it's a, a rough time of year to have a busted foot. I know Carol knows. Um, although I don't think he rescued a bus full of children from falling off a cliff <laughs> like you did. He got his foot caught in the third drink doing that. Yeah. That's how she pulled the bus up. Her foot was in the bear trap, yeah. and she pulled the bus up from off the cliff. Isn't my foot wonderful? It's pretty amazing, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Um, yeah, so please pray for West Tank. Uh, we're also going to pray for um, their son, Ralph, who's going to be having surgery next month for a hernia. So let's pray that that all works out. We know they can be very painful. So, yeah, it's painful now. Yeah, yeah. So let's get Humpty Dumpty back together again. Yeah. Um, we don't want anything falling out. That's generally not. The only thing good about that is I'll be able to see my son. I can just go over there and he can't run away. He can't run away. <laughs> <laughs> and if he does, you just poke him with a barbecue fork like you do Jim. Right? So. No, you know the hours that he works. I hardly ever see him. I was so surprised when they was able to come over and see me on my birthday. Yeah. So good. I didn't know that. He got, oh, that was so nice. Yeah, it was. That's so nice. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, let's see. We got that. We got that. Um, Jill, did we mention your cousin Emily before or after we started? It was before. Yeah. All right. We've been praying for Jill's cousin Emily. She had a baby premature. Um, so baby Kenny is now off the ventilator. Amen for that. He is still in the NICU and still has a feeding tube, but you know they're working their way through so he can breathe on his own now. Amen for that. Now they just got to get him eating on his own and then he'll be in great shape. So please pray for Emily and baby Kenny. Emily was having some issues with her blood pressure after the birth, so that's something we want to keep praying for. Um, oh, Bonnie, just let us know Marie passed away today. Oh, that's great. I'm sorry, Bonnie. We need to pray for Jerry. Yeah. I'm sure that he's just beside us. Yeah, Marie is Bonnie's sister-in-law, and Jerry is Bonnie's brother. So please pray for Jerry. He's just lost his wife. Um, please pray for their family. Um, her daughter just had a baby this past year. Um, Three months. Yeah, one of the praises was that the treatments were able to keep Marie well enough that she could be at the baby shower and hold her new grandbaby. Yeah. So that's a praise, but it's also very hard now for her daughter to lose her mom when she has a little one. Yeah. So please pray for their family. Please keep praying for Bonnie too. It's a, it's a hard time of year for her right now. We're coming up on the anniversary of when Barry passed away. And we know our anniversaries can be difficult. 
even though we have hope, we know that Barry was a believer, and we will see him again soon, it's still hard to be parted from our loved ones. So please keep Bonnie in your prayers. Thank you for sharing. She told us yesterday she didn't think she would make it through the night. Yeah. Yeah, that's what they thought. But she also said they thought the pain medicine was helping her. She was asleep. She wasn't She wasn't in pain. Yeah, she was on hospice. Yeah. Bonnie said thank you to everyone. So thank you, Bonnie. Um, let's see. Please keep praying for our sister Kay. She is still dealing with some health issues. Uh, we got to see uh, Charlie's new twinkling eyes. So his, he had his second cataract surgery this past week. Things went well. Um, so he goes back right after Christmas for another checkup and then hopefully if things are healed well enough they can do the exam to get him new glasses. Because uh, he's right in between. He see, he's seeing better than he did, so his old glasses don't work. But he still needs glasses, so he's getting by with some cheaters right now. Yeah, and he was wearing them down. His yeah, his own instead side. of bifocals, he bought cheaters, and he wears the cheaters way down yeah. here. Because he can see distance, but he can't see to read, <laughs> so he's going like this all the time. Um, but I told him now he doesn't have an excuse for not getting a deer next year when he's hunting. So, <laughs> um, uh, Along those lines, um, Jane is going to be having cataract surgery early next year. Same doctor, so he comes very highly recommended. Uh, Dr. Mazuka, right? Yeah. So uh, if anybody in Pennsylvania is looking for some new cataract surgery lens things. Did both yeah, he did he did Carol's too and he comes highly recommended by our crew. He did one of yours? Yeah. Two different doctors so you could compare. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which doctor do you like? You better? know me, I like to shop. Like to shop around. Shop around, around yeah. <laughs> It was insurance. Had a thing. coupon? Had a coupon, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. I'm being silly. But also, um, Barbara Dalbo has asked us to pray for her. She has her checkup with her eye doctor next month. There's some concern that they, the doctor might want to do another surgery. She yeah. very much does not want another surgery. No, she doesn't. So please pray there. Um, Let's see, we have several unspokens for some, two in particular for a couple of families we've been praying for going through some hard times. For our family, um, please keep praying for my stepdad, John. He's responding well to the steroids. Um, they got some of his blood work back. They, he was negative for Lyme disease, so they don't think that's the issue. Um, so they're still sorting some things out, but um, the steroids are helping with the pain he's been going through. So. That's a big praise. Um, the pain was quite bad. Yeah. So um, he's not completely out of the woods here, but much better than he was. So please keep praying for him. His head is healing. He was supposed to have a checkup today. Um, they're the dissolving stitches, so they don't take them out. But he has 22 stitches in his head right now. So I know. That's a lot. It is. But it means that when we go there for Christmas dinner, we can, the whole grandma got run over by a reindeer. We get to sing that about him. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, he's good enough that we can tease him now. He got clipped by the sleigh, I think, is what we're gonna say. Um, the Isaacs let us know. Um, please keep praying for our brothers and sisters at Village Arms. Um, you guys know we were praying for the Zeidler family. Um, but they've lost two more members of their community in the past two weeks, so that's up. Uh, they've lost three people within the course of about two weeks. And that's hard, it's real hard. They have a very close community over there. <clears throat> so this is the place where we went caroling. Yeah. All right, do we have any other prayer requests? I wanna lift up my sister Marie, uh, second anniversary of her Husband passing is coming up right after Christmas. He died from COVID. Okay. And we Thank also. 
also have them unspoken. Okay. Yeah, Eric has an unspoken as well. Don't whisper too loud or the mic will pick it up and they'll know what you're unspoken as. Okay, good. Are we ready to pray? All right, let's pray. Father God, we thank you again for a chance to gather. Thank you for the beautiful sunset tonight with the wispy clouds and the, and the violet and pink colors. Um, it looked like a painting tonight, Father. Thank you for that. And uh, thank you for this chance to gather together, Father. Thank you for this chance to speak with you and hear from you. Thank you that we can share our praises of your goodness and provision. And thank you that we can bring our concerns to you and lift our brothers and sisters up to your throne. Uh, Father, we want to begin by saying thank you for the good news from the Woodleys. Thank you for um, all of the care their family has received, um, the medical care for Alana, and just, just providing for their family. Father, thank you that the passports and everything worked out, that they had housing and a car. And Just thank you, Father, for, for those answers to prayer. We lift up the little boy that that Dr. Matt did surgery for on his Achilles tendon. Father, we pray that he will heal and not have any lasting problems due to that injury. We thank you so much that you've brought the Woodleys to Kujip Station. We thank you for their chance to share the gospel and to care for needs, especially the, the maternity unit, Father, the ability to take care of mothers as they give birth and take care of little babies. Thank you so much that they are there and carrying on that good work. We lift up our brothers and sisters in Peru tonight, Father. Um, we lift up the political unrest that they are going through. Father, we pray that the population would be safe, that the, the protests that are going on would not be violent. Um, we pray for our, our friends Jennifer and Harrison and their daughter Lisbeth. We pray that they would be safe during this season. And. Uh, we also lift up the praises from the church there. Father, thank you for um, everything you have been doing. Thank you for the pastor's gathering that they shared their testimony about. We lift up the, the women's meeting and the youth meeting that are coming up later this year. Father, we pray that your spirit would be poured out on those meetings, that those people would be filled with you and go out with their clay vessels overflowing into their home churches, that it might be shared all around the country. Father, we lift up those in our circle. Um, we lift up Kay, who is homesick today. We lift up Worky, who is homesick. Father, we're, we're sorry that the Lamans had to cancel their plans, but we pray that they would have a peaceful, restful time at home. We pray that Worky would perk up for her birthday, that she wouldn't be stuck sick in bed for her birthday. Um, Father, we thank you for the good news from Charlie, that his eyes are healing well from his cataract surgery. And uh, thank you for the good news from John, that he's responding well to his treatment. We pray that you would continue to be with him. Father, we thank you that um, Daryl's new medicine came in today, and we pray for that change. We pray that it would bring positive results to some of the troubles he's been dealing with. Amen. We lift up our brother, Pastor Wes, as his ankle is broken. Father, we pray that you would help him to get some sleep tonight and that you would heal that joint with no lasting troubles. We pray there'd be no aches and pains after this. We lift up our sister Carol with her busted foot too, Father. Um, we thank you for her spirit and her heart that's keeping her going even with that boot on, and we pray, Father, that you would bring healing to her broken bone, and again, that she would have no lasting pain after this. We lift up her son Ralph, Father. We pray that you would be present with him during his hernia operation. And um, maybe he'll get to have some extra time with his mom during his recovery. We lift up Jill's cousin Emily and her new baby Kenny. Father, we thank you for the good news that Kenny is off the vent. And we pray that um, you would continue to help him grow and become stronger and come home safe and sound. We think of little Troy and, and young Liam. Father, we lift them up as well as they are dealing with chronic health problems. Um, we know it's hard for young people, but Father, they are so resilient, it's amazing. And I uh, thank you for your care in those situations. 
We lift up our brothers and sisters at Village Arms, having lost three of their family in uh, the past couple of weeks. We know that's hard, especially around the holidays. And so, Father, I thank you for people like Mary and the other staff who are there to show love and care. And uh, I thank you for our chance to, to build these relationships. Thank you that we got to go caroling there. And thank you that Jim and Carol and Edgar are going to be bringing some food there next week. And uh, I pray, Father, that you would help us to continue to build those relationships. Father, we thank you for your provision in Darlene's life. Father, we thank you that she was offered this new job, and uh, we just ask that you would continue to show your favor to her. Um, Father, use her the way you have used her to not just bring physical care to the people she meets with, but to offer prayer and offer the gospel message, Father. Um, we think of the others in her old jobs who have lost their jobs, and we pray that they would all find new work. Um, we lift up David and Bethany as they are recovering from their illnesses, and we pray that they would continue to improve, Father. Please give them rest and healing, and help Nigel to be a good nurse. Mm -hmm. Father, we lift up Gloria Hess to you. We thank you that she was awake today, and Father, we just pray for protection. The last week, Father, it's, it's a miracle that she's still with us. And I pray that you would continue to show your miracles to her, that you would continue to perform signs and wonders in her life. Um, we pray, Father, for the three infections that she has, for her breathing. We pray for her husband, Steve. Father, please be with him. Um, Father, we lift up um, Bonnie and her family. We pray for Jerry, especially at the passing of Marie. Father, we ask that you would help Jerry to know that he is loved. Father, as he mourns, I pray that you would give him the hope that he would see Marie again. We pray for wisdom and compassion for Jerry and Marie's church family as they minister to him. We pray for Bonnie as she ministers to her brother. And uh, just help them all to rally around each other, Father. We lift up Bonnie and Jim's sister Marie who are coming up on anniversaries of losing spouses. We know there are others, Father, who are mourning the loss of loved ones right now. And that, that loss is more poignant when we come together during these holidays. And so, again, Father, I pray for comfort in the time of mourning. And I pray that we could gather together with each other to carry each other through these seasons. We lift up um, Diane's cousin Anne. Father, thank you for the good report from her surgery. We pray for continue and full healing for her. We lift up Pastor Doug, Father. We thank you that he's doing better than last night. And we pray that you would continue to bring relief from the pain he is dealing with. Um, thank you, Father, for carrying him through so much in his life. And um, this is just another example of you being with him. And we thank you for that, Father pray that he would back, be back up on his feet quickly, and especially that he would be um, <coughs> without pain when they're faced with travel coming up later at the end of the month. Um, we lift up our unspoken requests, Father, from Jim and Eric. We pray for the families that we are lifting up who are in difficult times right now. Father, we need your help. We, we can't do this without you. And we especially lift up those in our world who are trying to, who are trying to get through life without you. I pray, Father, that in this season they would see the gift of light and love that you offer and that people would turn their hearts toward you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <laughs> All right, we've got one little thing to do before we get into Ezekiel. I just want to take a moment and ask if anyone would like to share anything from... Um, the devotional book we've go been going through. Um, it's for those who are watching online, we've been reading Let Us Adore Him by Samantha Chombo. And yes, that's available on Kindle and online. And you can get a better price if you go through the foundrypublishing.org. Um, that's the what used to be called Nazarene Publishing House. So you can get them a little cheaper there than you can on Amazon. Did anybody have anything they'd like to share? I mean, of course, I've always got some questions. Um, 
Tuesday's reading um, was about the woman who anointed Jesus' feet. The woman who barged into a fancy dinner and got on her knees. She wept. She wiped Jesus' feet with her hair and she anointed his feet with a perfumed ointment that would have cost a year's salary. She broke the alabaster jar and, and anointed his feet. Um, some of the questions there, I know Jim and I were chatting a little bit. They're a little, they're getting a little hard. Um, in that story, Jesus is invited to the home of a Pharisee, kind of a big fancy formal dinner. And when Jesus comes into the home, he is not shown the deference or respect that a guest normally would. He was not given water to wash his feet. He was not given oil to anoint his head. Now that last part was something you gave to really honor guests, but um, he wasn't really treated all that well. And then during the course of the dinner, this woman comes in uninvited and chose this gracious act of love and sacrifice to anoint, anoint him, uh, to anoint his feet. Um, so there was some conversation in the devotional reading about the difference between the way those two people reacted to Jesus and what we can learn. So the one question was, and I'm going to ask this, I'm going to ask both these questions, but one is, whom do you identify with in that story? The Pharisee, who was not all that grateful because he didn't really seek that great of forgiveness. He had been following the rules and was just kind of coasting along. Or the woman, who had lived in great sin and had been forgiven greatly and reacted in passionate worship. I know you answered this question, so I'm going to pick on you first, Carol. Did you pick a person that you identified with? The woman. The woman? Yeah. Thank you. Jim, how about you? Yeah, just oh. that I, I never have enough to give. Yeah. I, I chose Simon and I made a notation afterwards that said, uh, by nature we think that being a good person is enough, but it isn't. We need to give all completely. We need to share the love that God shares with us. Venus just posted, she said she identifies with the woman as well. Yeah. She did something else, but we'll get to that in just a second. Did anybody else answer that question, or would you like a chance to answer that question? I cheated like usual, and said both. <laughs> um, I kind of rambled a bit, but basically I was saying that the more I get to know Jesus, the more I learn about the depth of his love and sacrifice, and the more I feel like that woman. So, then today's question, Venus brought this up, today's question, um, this is on page 101, was what are the things that pull you away from abiding in love? from living in that healthy love relationship with God. Venus wrote for her, it's a fear of rejection. Mm -hmm. That a fear of rejection keeps her from abiding in love. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being vulnerable to share that, Venus. I know that's a deeply personal thing, especially sharing on a stream over the internet. But thank you. Would anyone else like a chance to answer that? What, is there something in your life that is pulling you away from abiding in love with Jesus? He wrote down worldly distractions. Worldly distractions? Okay. Everyday life stuff. Everyday life stuff? Yeah, yeah we get wrapped up in things that aren't as important as our relationship with God is. Yeah. And we tend to forget it. Yeah, I mean, there might not be a Canaanite fertility temple in the corner, but <laughs> there's just as much in our culture that distracts us from God as there was back then. And maybe even more because our culture teaches us that these things are good and right and we should focus on them instead of God. Yeah. That's a good one. 
Venus has another comment, okay. Oh, she said she didn't look at it the way I explained it when we talked about Tuesday's question. Well, if you'd like to share more about how you kind of took it, you're welcome to, Venus. But I know it's a personal thing, so if you'd rather not put that on the internet, I understand. I understand. Um, the second question, which builds to the third, we're going somewhere. The second one are, what are things that help you to abide in love with Christ? That's me. <laughs> That's me. The control, the stress, the wanting to everything to. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you, sister. I hear you. Yeah. We were reading scripture. Yeah. Doing this, right? Devotional time. I, I want to say this in a way that I like the fact that I know when we get together, we're going to talk about these questions because it gives me a little extra nudge to make sure I keep up <laughs> and that I answer all the questions. Yeah. Same with us. <laughs> yeah, it's good. That, that extra accountability is helpful yeah. to do it together. So what book are we going to work on next? <laughs> well, we're going to have a little bit of a break, but we are going to be doing an Advent devotional again starting. Lent. That's what I said, Lent. <laughs> um, we are going to be doing a Lent devotional together. Um, we're, I'm working on picking it now. I have it narrowed down. I think, think we're going to do the one through the foundry again. Okay. But I don't have a sample copy yet to read it. So, yeah. So I'll try to go back and forth, right? Have at least two seasons out of the year yeah. where we have these roughly 40 day periods mm -hmm. where we do devotional time together. And then some time in between to kind of do what works for you. So we kind of have ebbs and flows, right? The, we all do it together so we can experience that. And then we have the freedom to do our own thing for a little while and kind of go back and forth. Yeah. Um, the third question was, how will you be more intentional in abiding in the love of Christ? And I put, stop doing the stuff I wrote in number one and do the stuff I wrote in number two. There's something we talk about at the hospital, right? That there are some choices that help you move towards wellness, uh -huh. and there are some choices that move you away from being well. Mm -hmm. And being well as a person means making more of the choices that bring you towards wellness, and less of the choices that pull you away from wellness. Mm -hmm. And that's, our, that's spiritual formation, right? Getting to know ourselves, getting to listen to, learning how to listen to the Holy Spirit, and making less choices that pull us away from God or distract us and make consistent choices or intentional choices that help us to lean into Jesus. It's consistency. That's the thing, right? Consistency. Yeah. I might have shared this, but my first couple years that I did track in high school, you know, track's not only around, and my first year I was a freshman, and I was a... Uh, I had been, what your dad say? I was a late bloomer and an early fader. That's what Jill's dad says. I was a late bloomer, so a lot of the other guys were bigger and stronger than me, so I worked real hard in the weight room, and I gained a lot of strength. But then, over the fall, I didn't work out. Like, over the summer, I had a summer job where I was working out, mm -hmm. and, but then in the fall, I didn't. And when track came around again, I lost a bunch of what I had gained, and I had to spend the first half of the season trying to get back to where I was when I left last year. So I spent the first half of the season just playing catch up. Yeah. And I know that that example uses muscles, but I think the same thing works with our heart, right? That when we're inconsistent, we end up spending a lot of our time playing catch up. Yeah. And it means we don't make the kind of progress we could make if we were consistent. Yeah. 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 Like my brother-in-law, He's, he's kind of a bodybuilder guy. And uh, he works out consistently enough and his muscles are big enough that when he doesn't work out, he loses weight. Yeah. You know, if he doesn't work out, his muscle, yeah, he deflates. 
I mean, you think people work out, you burn calories, so if you skip working out, you gain weight. But for him, when he doesn't work out, he loses weight because his muscle mass goes down. Uh -huh. Muscles weigh more. Yeah, like when we go on vacation. Yeah, so he's got to like find a gym to visit when we're on vacation, so he doesn't inflate <laughs> like a balloon. But um, that's kind of how our spirituality is, right? That's if we don't use those spiritual muscles, they wither. What was that? He deflates. He deflates. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, one of the way Venus wrote, one of the ways she tries to abide with Jesus is she tries to love her co-workers and when she can't to lean on Jesus to help her to love them. It's a good answer. Um, she said that it also helps her to abide with Jesus when she remembers that Jesus died for her. How he was so unselfish. It's so amazing. It helps me to try to live in God's love. And Amen. to know that I am not alone. Amen. Amen. Uh, listen, I told Venus in Sunday school she should be teaching these classes. <laughs> but thank you, Venus. Those were great answers. Well, we wrote something similar to that in our yeah. answer to that question. Said, uh, we said by recognizing the blessings or the love, you can substitute love for blessing, blessing for love, either way. Yeah, they're all wrapped up together, yeah. But by recognizing the blessings slash love that he bestows on us every day, and by sharing those blessings of sharing that love with others. Yeah. You understood all my scribble, huh? How about that? Yeah, because we're not diminished by giving. It's like that whole candle thing, right? right? When your candle lights somebody else's candle, your flame doesn't get smaller. Right. But the light in the room gets greater. Yeah. Amen. And just to them. see how God works with that, you know? Like, I was thinking a lot about your testimony from last Sunday and the idea that, like, one of the people who's called to ministry that you're working with is a captain of one of the boats, right? And how he has access to the port and he's on a boat with, with fishermen and just the way God makes that all work. It's not something we could ever plan or make happen on our own. But man, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. All right. Well, why don't we jump into Ezekiel since we've been at this for close to an hour now. But prayer has to be a priority, right? Yeah. Um, you probably noticed that for the last year, we moved prayer from the end of our meeting to the beginning because we want prayer to be a focus of our gatherings. And that only happens when we're intentional and consistent, right? Those are words Carol just used. So it means we're spending a focused amount of time in our classes on prayer, sharing our prayer requests and praying. And that's important important. Okay, so we are in Ezekiel chapter 43. Um, through the course of chapter 42, Ezekiel had been shown a vision of a new temple, and then in chapter 43, he begins to see some amazing things. Um, do you remember what happened in the beginning of chapter 43 last week? Does anybody remember that? We had a big entrance. If you want to look at verses 1 through 9, you'll find the answer. The man brought him back to the east gateway of the temple. Mm -hmm. He gets brought back to the east gateway, and in verse 2, what happens? It said that the, uh, the glory of God of Israel appeared from the east. Yeah. The glory of the Lord appeared. And what did the glory of God do? It sounded like... Uh, of rushing waters. Yeah. And then came and entered the temple. Yeah. And Ezekiel says, seeing the glory of the Lord was like his earlier vision, back in chapter 1 of seeing the glory of the Lord. Um, that vision had a couple parts. Do you remember the first part of Ezekiel's vision from chapter 1? That was the, uh, what Noah mentioned, the biblically accurate angels, right? With the eyeballs and the faces, oh. <laughs> and the wheel within a wheel, yeah, the uh, heavenly hoverboards, yeah. Um, but then also, he saw the glory of the Lord in the form of a storm rushing toward them. Remember, they were about to lose a war, and all that was happening. But now, instead of a storm rushing in to destroy, what does he see? What does the glory of the Lord do? Mess things up? 
Now it fills up the temple, right? Yeah. And where we left things last week, we kind of tied this into what happened when um, the Israelites under Moses' lead, well, under God's lead through Moses, had built the tabernacle, how God's glory filled the tabernacle. And how when Moses would hang out in God's glory, what would happen to him? He turned into a glow stick, right? Oh, yes. Yes. He turned into a glow stick. Um, so, where we are picking up, um, Ezekiel's kind of got the one, he fell on his face, he sees a wonderful thing. Now he gets some instructions. So, can somebody <laughs> read... Ezekiel chapter 43, verses 10 to 12 for us, please. We had started talking about this last week, but we didn't get all the way through it. So I want to pick up there. 10 to 12. Okay. I can do it. Thank you. Son of man, describe to the people of Israel the temple I have shown you, so they will be ashamed of all their sins. Let them study its plan, and they will be ashamed of what they have done. Describe to them all the specifications of the temple, including its entrances and exits, and everything else about it. Tell them about its decrees and laws. Write down all these specifications and decrees as they watch, so they will be sure to remember and follow them. And this is the basic law of the temple, absolute holiness. The entire top of the mountain where the temple is built is holy. Yes, this is the basic law of the temple. Thank you. So we talked about the shame part last week, but I want to talk about what comes next, right? If the people were just left feeling ashamed, where would that leave them? Dead. Yeah. Have you ever felt ashamed? Yeah. What do you want to do when you're ashamed? Hide. Hide, yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't want anybody to see you, right? You don't want anybody to know what you've done. When Adam and Eve were ashamed at their sin in the garden, do you know what they did? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they ran and hid from God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. So, if we left it there with the hiding from God and our shame, well, that would be a pretty terrible vision, right? Destruction and hiding. But it does not end there. In verse 11, God repeats the command to tell everybody. He says, write down all of these specifications and decrees so that what will happen? The very end of verse 11. So they'll be sure to remember and follow them. So the people will remember and follow them. I was trying to think of a good example that would relate to this. And uh, I got to thinking about the day I got my license, all right? So I had done a bunch of work and saved up money and bought a car, but it wasn't registered yet because I didn't have a license. I couldn't register a vehicle. So I took my driving test in the morning. My grandmother took me in her car and I passed and I got my license. And then I had to go into work for the afternoon. And I had been riding my bike back and forth to work. And so my parents took pity on me, and instead of making me ride my bike to work that afternoon with my license in my pocket, they let me borrow their almost brand new truck. Okay? So I drove it, and I parked next to one of our outbuildings. I was doing landscaping at the cemetery then. And I parked on a hill towards the building, and the truck was a stick shift. So you might know that in a stick shift, you got to be really careful when you're on a hill that you don't roll. So I was really focused. Don't roll into the garage. Don't roll into the garage, right? So I had it in reverse, and I got the gas, and I got the clutch, and I'm looking behind me, and I do it, and I don't roll, and then I hear a big screech, right? There was a storm drain right at the corner, and there was a big metal pole so that people wouldn't hit the storm drain. And when I backed up, I was so busy not rolling and looking behind me that I wasn't looking in front of me, and I scraped the fender along that pole. And the fender had been 
or the pole had been spray painted bright orange <laughs> and the truck was black. So it left this bright orange scratch down the fender and it caught the headlight and popped it out. So when I got out of the truck, there's a bright orange scratch down the fender and the headlight is hanging by the wire like an eyeball popped out. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, what have I done? And in my shame, I had to go home and tell my parents what I did. I wanted to hide. Right? Now, I had to pay to fix the truck. Um, and I learned something very important that day, right? That when you back up, you don't just look at what's behind you, you have to look at what's in front of you too, right? Because you can hit stuff. If I had run away and hid at that moment, what do you think would have happened? Parents would have been very mad at you. Yeah, well, I would have also been very hungry because I was a 17 year old um, and I had been lost. But yeah. The shame would have followed me. The shame would have followed me. And I'm not going to say the shame doesn't follow me. I still kick myself thinking about that. <laughs> but you were 17. I, but I was 17, right? And so instead of rotting in my shame, I can take a step back from it, right? And say, what can I learn from this? And how can I keep from doing it again? I can't undo what happened, but I can try to make sure it doesn't happen again. So that's what's going on here, right? The people face the consequences of their actions. They had the war, they lost the war, the city was destroyed, the walls were torn down, the temple was burned, their friends and family were killed in the battle. That has happened. And so now they've got to decide what are they going to do next? Are they just going to rot in that shame and just, that's us, like forever? Or are they going to choose to keep going and try to learn from it and try to be different? These rules that Ezekiel's telling them about, like how to build a temple and things, is this new information? Nope. They, they heard all this before when they built the first temple, right? Yeah. So... It's a little different. It's a little bit different. But it's, it's different, but the same. Yeah. Why did God have to repeat it? So you listen. Yeah. They didn't <laughs> listen the first time, right? Right. So God's telling them again. They've been hurt. They've been broken. Their leaders and shepherds were false. And remember, a few chapters ago, God promised he would bring a good shepherd, a new shepherd. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk a little bit about verse 12, because it gets pretty intense here. This is the basic law of the temple. What is it? Absolute holiness. Absolute holiness. And then God said something about the, the mountain. What's he say? The entire top of the mountain where the temple is built is holy. Yeah, that whole spot is holy. When Ezekiel's hearing that, what does that spot look like? A mountain. Well, when Solomon got done with it, there was a big fancy temple on it, right? Yeah. But when Ezekiel is seeing this vision of the future, what does that mountain look like? A rebuilt temple. Well, not yet. The vision is of the future. Oh, okay. Right now, it's rubble. Yeah. It's been it burned off. and broken. All of the holy things have been looted out of it. Yeah, sold off. Yeah, sold off. Maybe the Ark of the Covenant, we don't know. Maybe it was hidden in the basement. We talked about that a little last week. <laughs> but this place that is supposed to be God's footstool is burnt and broken and destroyed. But God says, no, it's, it's still holy. He doesn't say, he, sorry, let me ask this another way. Is that mountaintop holy because the temple is there? No. Mm -hmm. What makes that mountaintop holy? Because God said it is. God, exactly. Yeah. Does God need a giant stone building to make, a, <laughs> make something holy? No. No. It is because he said it is. If I pick a mountain on my own and build the biggest stone temple ever, covered in gold and whatever, Chocolate fountains in every room, right? <laughs> the best, the best temple, right? You ever saw? Would that make it holy? Disney World. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Is Disney World holy? Nope. No. No. Wow. 
it's pretty amazing, right? But it's not holy. Expensive. <laughs> yeah. I know some of you heard this on Sunday, but when when Pastor Doug meets with those fishermen near the capital city, what kind of church do they meet in? Do you, you guys remember? Open you air. can't answer because I know you know this. Mm-hmm. What? Open air. Yeah, they meet under a tree. Yeah. Do you think that place is holy? Yeah. Amen. Is it holy because of a big fancy building? No. Nope. Is it holy because Pastor Doug's so awesome? No. Nope. He's awesome, but that's not why it's yeah. holy. <laughs> it's because God is there, right? When people yeah. gather together in the name of God, that's holy. That's what the people forgot. They thought, well, we got the big building, and we got the family line and the family name, and we got the Ark of the Covenant, and we got all these gold shields that Solomon made, and we're good. You know, nothing's ever going to touch us. Yeah. It's like that hare that ran so fast he thought the turtle would never beat him. <laughs> yeah, like that old fable. And then he fell asleep, and the turtle slapped his mouth. So we went from the description to some instructions and teaching about holiness. Now we're going to cut back to another description. Can somebody read verses 13 to 17 for us? Okay. Thank you, Joe. These are the measurements of the altar in long cubits, that cubit being a cubit, that cubit being a cubit in the hand breadth. Its gutter is a cubit deep and a cubit wide with a rim of one span around the edge. And this is the height of the altar. From the gutter on the ground up to the lower ledge, it is two cubits high and a cubit wide. And from the smaller ledge up to the larger ledge, it is four cubits high and a cubit wide. The altar hearth is four cubits high and four horns project upward from the hearth. The altar hearth is square 12 cubits long and 12 cubits wide. The upper ledge also is square, 14 cubits long and 14 cubits wide, with a rim of half a cubit and a gutter of a cubit all around. The steps of the altar face east. This is so hard to read. <laughs> it is, and it's complicated, right? <laughs> it's a gutter I don't think I've ever said cubit so many times in my life. It's a gutter of a cubit. The gutter, well, what is a gutter? Storm drain. Storm drain. What's it, what if, if you have a gutter on your house? But that's what's that for? That's, that's for keeping water. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, what happens when you sacrifice animals on an altar? Blood. It's blood. Yeah. So we just had like a chapter and a half where Ezekiel was taken around by this human figure, and they had the measuring rod and the linen measuring cord. And they measured everything, and we got a billion different measurements. Now, we're going back to measurements again. We, in the beginning of this chapter, God was just like, the whole mountain's holy. Yeah, I'm holy because of God. And now we're back to, it needs to be this many cubits, and this many inches, and this many, this and that, and this, and face this way. Why do you think... Well, I'm not sure it's so much about size, but there's about the importance of what he's describing. Okay. These, this set of measurements, is it about the building? No, it's about the sacrificial altar. The altar, yeah. What did the people use the altar for? The animals. Well, kill animals, yeah. So, and also grain and other things. Worship it? Worship, maybe, yeah. You use the word kill and the word worship. There's a specific word I'm looking for. Sacrifice. Sacrifice, yeah. Why did the people make sacrifices? And there's several different answers here. So don't shout out what you think. Why? As a gift to God. As a gift to God, sure, like a wave offering. I was going to say a please God. For their sins. Sure, as a sin offering, yeah. What was yours? I was going to say to please God. To please God, yeah. They were told, if you sin, you need to make a sacrifice on this altar, and that blood will pay the debt of your sin. That the payment for sin is blood. And if there is no payment, the weight of the sin is not lifted. Ezekiel and his people, do they have an altar? 
he's seeing a vision of one in the rebuilt temple. No. But at that moment, do they have one? I don't think so. No. no. This is a really important point. When the people are, are sent into exile in Babylon, they're still stuck together. They still have a prophet talking to them. Right. God still does amazing things like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the furnace and David in the lion's den. But there's something very important they don't have. What is it? Sacrificial the sacrificial altar. They can't make those sacrifices. This physical act that was at the heart of their worship, they can't do it. So what happens when you can't do the thing that you define your worship around? You have to build one. Yeah, but in the meantime, you're stuck, right? Think about when COVID hit and everything had to change. When when, and I'm not going to say we stopped having church, we just had to have it a different way. Mm -hmm. But think about how different it was when we were trying to worship online, on Zoom and Facebook and all that stuff, and not able to come in person. Right. That was really hard, especially in the beginning. Yeah, because we, when we're here, we can go up to the altar. Yeah. But when we're home, I'm sorry, it just seemed weird just kneeling in and going around. It is weird. And I'll bet it was weird kneeling by a canal in Babylon, right? Yeah. So there's these kind of two things, right? There's the, it will be like this again. You will be able to worship the way you were commanded again. But right now, you don't have that. So this is hope for the future. But also, how do we deal with it in the present? When we read, let, let's say when we read the Revelation of John, my favorite part at the end, right? Chapter 21 and 22. We have a promise that in the end, death and sorrow will be no more. God will wipe every tear from our eye, and we're not going to have to deal with these things anymore. And amen, we look forward to that. But what did we just find out from Bonnie today? Yeah, Marie died. So we are living in a time that's not that different from Ezekiel. A time when we have a promise from God that things will be made right. But that promise has not fully come to completion yet. So how do we worship? How do we encounter God's holiness? How are we transformed by God when we're living without that promise fully revealed? That's a hard thing to do. It's hard to gather and celebrate and worship when people who we love have died. Mm. And there's, there's no other way to say that. Right? Jerry, I am sure, is weeping in his heartbrokenness right now. Right? And their daughter. Yeah, and their daughter Lisa. Yeah. Bonnie is weeping. But, you know? Um, and Don. Yeah. And that's... We can't ignore that. And so we have to hold both these things in our heart, right? The recognition that things are not the way they should be right now. But also the hope and the peace that comes from knowing God is going to make it right. That's kind of what Advent's about, isn't it? Knowing that things are not right right now. But God has begun to make things right, and he will complete that work. And our time in the middle is a time of hope. I just saw Grandma Brown smile from Marie in heaven. Yeah. Just as vivid as Papa. Yeah. Welcoming her into heaven. Yeah. And so, what you're experiencing right now, people online can't see it, but. I see tears and I see a smile at the same time. That's what Ezekiel was feeling. That's what we experience, right? And that's, that's our lot, that's, where we, that's the time we live in. We weep, but we also smile, right? I think that's what this is about, you know? Things are broken and messed up and separate, but they're not gonna stay that way. And the next part, this is going to sound a little complicated, but let me read it and then hear me when we're done, okay? I'm going to finish out the chapter. Then he said to me, Son of man, 
This is what the Sovereign Lord says. These will be the regulations for the burning of offerings and the sprinkling of blood when the altar is built. At that time, the Levitical priests of the family of Zadok, who minister before me, are to be given a young bull for a sin offering, says the Lord, Sovereign God. You will take some of its blood and smear it on the four horns of the altar, the four corners of the upper ledge, and the curb that runs around the ledge. This will cleanse and make atonement for the altar. Then take the young bull for the sin offering and burn it at the appointed place outside the temple area. On the second day, sacrifice as a sin offering a young male goat that has no physical defects, then cleanse and make atonement for the altar again, just as you did with the young bull. When you have finished the cleansing ceremony, offer another young bull that has no defects and a perfect ram from the flock. You are to present them to the Lord, and the priests are to sprinkle salt on them and offer them as a burnt offering to the Lord. Every day for seven days, a male goat, a young bull, and a ram from the flock will be sacrificed as a sin offering. None of these animals may have physical defects of any kind. Do this each day for seven days to cleanse and make atonement for the altar, thus setting it apart for holy use. On the eighth day and on each day afterward, the priests will sacrifice on the altar the burnt offerings and peace offerings of the people. Then I will accept you. I, the Sovereign Lord, have spoken. There's all these rules about what animals can be sacrificed and when and how many. And it's a lot, right? Yeah. Does anybody know how much a bull costs? I haven't purchased a bull recently. <laughs> I don't know, but two bulls were looking at each other and go, what? <laughs> well, back then, a bull, that was like your pickup truck, your tractor, and your 401k all wrapped together, right? Yeah. That was it your pulled body. your car, it did your work, you, you used it to breed to build your future, yeah. and when, you, when it stopped doing those things, you ate it and it gave life to your family, right? So sacrificing a young bull, that's like sacrificing a brand new pickup truck. Right? Um, now God talks about offering sacrifices without blemish. What is a blemish? What does that mean? That's an impurity. An impurity? That's yeah. one word, yeah. Less than perfect. Less than perfect, sure. Don't bring me the three-legged bull, right? Yeah. Nobody wants the pizza that had the top of the box smushed on it and pulled all the cheese off, right? Mm -hmm. God's saying, bring me the good one. Yeah. After all this description about the altar and the blood and the animals and the priests, does he say, these animals will be pleasing to me? Does he say, then I will accept all these bulls you're going to kill? No. What does he say at the very end in verse 27? <clears throat> Then I will accept the people's sacrifices. Not even sacrifices. Well, you sacrifice. had the priests will sacrifice on the altar the burnt offerings and peace offerings of the people. Then I will accept you. Just I pause right there. The Lord has then I will accept you. The people who are in exile a people who have been completely destroyed, their city ripped down, the walls broken, the temple broken and burned and desecrated, there is a day coming when they will be in God's holy place and God will accept them. What does that mean for Ezekiel? What do you think? It's like a full circle. It's hope. That which is lost can be found again. Yeah, and everything that he has seen, because he's prophet, is coming true. Yeah. I'm going to close, and I know we're running a little long here, but I want to finish this thought. In Luke chapter 15, it's the chapter of lost things. Right? We have the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. 
often called the prodigal son, right? I'm going to fast forward through part of that story. Son's a knucklehead, runs off, blows a bunch of money, bad stuff. The son says to himself, maybe, just maybe, I can come home and my dad will give me a job. He says, I can never be a son again, but maybe he will hire me because he's a good boss and he'll treat his employees right, right? He says, I can never be a son again. What happens when he gets back home? They sacrificed, they sacrificed the, the youngest calf for him. Yeah. And just before that, what does the dad do when he sees his son coming down the road? He rejoices. Yeah, and he runs to meet him. And he says, put a ring on his finger and a cloak on his back and shoes on his feet. My son who's dead is alive again. And make a feast. Yeah. See, the people who are in Babylon are probably thinking, like, we can never be that again. But maybe, maybe we can live. Maybe we can have some sort of diminished future. We've lost the, the gift of Abraham. We've messed everything up. We've lost our city. We've lost our temple. We've lost everything. Like that son who says, I can never be a son again. But God's saying, yeah, you can. You can. This is just like the conversation Jesus has with Nicodemus, right? To be born again. Mm -hmm. That's what we're talking about. This whole chapter, yeah, we're measuring the altar and we're talking about bulls and rams and goats and stuff. But this is about being born again, right? You're dead, but you can be born again. Do you remember the vision that Ezekiel got in chapter 37? Ezekiel shown the valley of dry and scattered bones. And God asked him a question. Do you remember the first question God asked him? Son of man, can these bones live? And he says, only you know. Which is really, I don't know. Yeah. Like, I don't see any way this could happen, but you're God, so I'm scared, so I'll just say I don't know. This is God, this is God taking that symbolic vision of the dry scattered bones being brought back in the bodies, and he's saying, listen, it, this is going to happen in reality. The temple will be rebuilt. There will be an altar. There will be priests. There will be sacrifices. And I will accept you. Right? I will accept you. This is, it's all coming back around. The thing that you thought was lost and you could never have, when we are in our shame, in our darkness, in our pain, God can never love me. God could never want me. And God's saying, yes, I will accept you. I will accept you. So I thought, man, the fact that our devotion asked some of these questions, and this was our lesson for tonight, right? But that's the promise. I will accept you. And it's not our own blood that makes it that way. It's the blood of a sacrifice. Now, the blood of that, those sacrifices didn't really cut it, right? But one who is greater died on our behalf so that God would accept us. I'm starting to preach. I'm starting to preach. Bonnie was talking about Marie, and she said she was a godly woman. Amen. So right now, we're like, you know, Jerry is like Ezekiel sitting by that, that canal in Babylon. Things are a mess. It hurts. But God says, I will accept you. And it will be made right. Let's close in prayer. Father God, thank you for this word of hope that you gave to Ezekiel. And thank you that it got passed down to us. Father, thank you that we live in the time that we do. Thank you that we live at a time where we can say Jesus is risen. Amen. 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 And Father, thank you that even though we're dealing with natural disasters and diseases and wars and rumors of wars and all those things, that we can look forward in hope. Father, help us to find our rest in that hope in you. In Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And I got a little preachy on that one. I'll try to be a little less preachy next time. Here's your reminder. Next Wednesday, we're not having a meeting here. 
because it's going to be right after Christmas. We're going to jump back into chapter 44 next week. And here's a hint. Did you notice who it said the priest was that would be able to offer the sacrifice? Did it just say the priests of the Levites or the priests of Aaron? Prince. It listed a name. Oh, you're getting you're even further ahead of me. <laughs> Zadok. Do you know who Zadok you've is? Been, you've been reading ahead. <laughs> he did read ahead. That's from the next chapter. Um, Zadok. Why Zadok? Why didn't he just say Levites or the priests of Aaron? Why did he say Zadok? Hmm. I don't know. Well, you're going to have to wait until next year to find I, out. I have to read ahead. Yeah, or you can read ahead like Josiah does. Yeah, but that's an important part. Our, our friends online, we love you. We'll see I am you the soon. cat. I am the cat. Is the cat man going to say goodbye? Yes. Bye, cat man. Thirty-five.